I can see there are 10 attendees and uh, welcome and uh, you will be spending wonderful time with Lilavati. I really admire her works and I, I sort of requested her to speak uh, on a different instance where you probably have heard her in the department. And uh, so Lilavati received her bachelor's degree in computer engineering from University of Pune and PhD in computer science from the Duke University. She worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the National Institute of Health and later at the Center for Modeling and Simulations in the University of Pune. She began her independent research career at the Chemical Engineering Department of CSIR National Chemical Laboratory. Uh, since 2021, she has been a faculty member at ISA Pune. Uh, her group works on designing algorithms for um, learning from diverse data sets, but as far as I understand, she works a lot on the regulatory uh, side of the story and uh, is quite mathematical and algorithmic flavors uh, is what I get to see in her work, which is great because I personally come from a more computer science background, so I get to appreciate more uh, what uh, exactly she is doing, but I think this is a wonderful opportunity for the students to um, learn about uh, how she solves what she solves. Okay, now that's with that. I think it is over to Lavati, and uh, I'll be excited. It'll be exciting uh, to hear from her the recent most works that she is doing. Thanks, and Lavati, over to you. And Thank recording you. has already begun. Okay, bye. And thanks a lot, Deepakar. Very nice introduction. And uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to all the organizers. I'm happy to be here. Um, so like Devarka mentioned, I'm currently at, I'm now at ISER Pune, but um, until a few months ago, I was at CSR uh, National Chemical Laboratory, which is right next door. Um, and all the work that I'm gonna discuss today was done there, right? It was funded by um, NCL and, and a couple of other um, uh, national funding agencies and um, was largely done by two really smart uh, graduate students in the lab, Sneha and Anushwa. And um, I'm gonna discuss about three uh, sort of related methods uh, that we've develop developed in, in the lab over the last few years. Okay, so, so the big picture in, in my lab is to, like Devarka was saying, is to understand regulation. And very specifically, we're trying to get to a level where we can predict effect of mutations, uh, mutations in the DNA. And of course, if you have a mutation in, in your gene um, and that causes uh, an aberrant RNA or a protein molecule to be created, uh, sure, you can have um, uh, issues with the function of the protein, right? Things can go wrong or things can go differently. Um, but we are not looking at mutations which are within genes. We are looking at specifically at mutations which are outside of genes, right? So in the non-coding part of the genome, which makes up a large chunk of our genome. And for most eukaryotes, that's true. And, um, so what really are we looking at? We're looking at regulatory regions. So these are regions that um, which are not, not in the gene. Um, basically, they're not in the coding part of the gene necessarily, but they have some effect on the transcription of a target gene, okay? So mutation within these regions um, uh, can cause an aberrant regulation of the gene. So your gene might be perfectly fine, uh, but your um, um, regulation goes wrong. So you get, um, um, maybe the gene is expressed when it shouldn't be, or it is expressed at a higher level and so on, or just not expressed. Um, and these are harder to predict the functional consequences of mutations outside of genes because the architecture of regulatory regions is not very well um, established. Right? And that's really what we're trying to do in our lab to understand the architecture of regulatory regions. Um, so what are regulatory regions? What, what is our understanding of them? So these are regions along the genome, right? And which have, um, um, which bring about some conformational change in the chromatin and cause uh, transcription to either happen or not happen. So what I've shown is just three types of regions here. Um, and they are sort of categorized by us humans based on what uh, 
functional effect they seem to have. So enhancers and promoters uh, promote activation um, to happen, and they do so by interactions between these proteins called transcription factors, which I'm sure you all know about. Uh, the, the audience here is, is well aware of what that, those are. Um, and they bind DNA in a sequence specific manner. Okay? So, so if you are looking for potential effects of mutations, you would really be looking here, right? Where the protein is making contact to it with its binding site, right? And these binding sites are, you know, sequence uh, specific. So protein will not just bind anything. It has, it favors few regions. Um, so what we'd like to do is to have a, a sense of where every protein might like to bind, right? So then we can go ahead from that and predict the effect of mutations. Now, um, all mutations within a binding site also are not equivalent, because if you look at, say, for example, um, this uh, blue protein might bind to a CACGTTC, but the same protein might bind slightly different um, regions at other places, or just recognize different um, sequences, maybe with varying affinity, maybe not, right? Maybe um, a varying affinity related to a cofactor. Right? That's also possible. Um, so, which is why we don't have a single word associated with each protein. And you must have seen pictures like this, right? Which are called logos and are sort of represent the variability um, um, at the same time, the specificity of a protein when it recognizes uh, DNA. Okay? So what we'd like to do is, you know, get a sense of these logos for every protein. Now, um, uh, this was much harder a few years ago, but then you, but then came the um, advances in sequencing technology and associated with that uh, advances in experimental high throughput assays. So one such assay is the chip seek assay, right, which um, helps uh, a biologist to detect all regions um, that are bound by a specific protein, protein of interest. In this case, it's the blue protein again. Um, um, and and the, the, the way it works is that um, you start off with your living cells that you're interested in um, and you um, treat them with formaldehyde or some cross-linking agent. So all your protein, protein and protein DNA interactions, you know, get fixed. Um, and then you isolate the chromatin, you cut it up and you immunoprecipitate uh, with an antibody specific to your protein. So this is where specificity to your protein comes into play. Um, and then you reverse the cross links and then you get a set of regions that are associated with your protein. You do a similar exercise with your uh, reference sample, right? Just like your control. And then you use these sequencing technologies to sequence these little pieces of DNA and map them back onto the genome. And what you get are such maps, right? Along the genome. So you get a genome wide map, you can see um, how, the, where the protein, uh, which regions the protein is occupying related to genes, related to other proteins and so on, right? But if you think about our original problem as to which uh, locations or which nucleotides are relevant for the protein uh, DNA interaction, we need to look at the DNA, right? At those regions. And if you look at, you, you'll get lots of such uh, regions based on, of course, the activity of the protein. Some proteins are um, uh, binding ubiquitously, some, uh, well, to, by ubiquitously, I mean to a lot of places. Uh, others might, you know, not be required at that level. But at the end of it, what you're getting <clears throat> is along every chromosome that you are looking at, these regions, right, <clears throat> at the peaks that you saw. Um, but the protein is binding somewhere uh, in there. Right? Not always at the center, right? You, it could be anywhere. So how then do you get from these bigger regions, which are about 200 to sometimes even 1,000 bases long, uh, to a small, really relevant, um, you know, maybe 12 to 20 base pair blue region where the protein is making contact? So this is an old problem, although the technology is new. Um, it, and, and when people were looking at co-regulated promoters, they were looking at um, promoters that seemed to have the same protein uh, binding there. And people came up you know, with this problem of motif discovery. And if you've taken any uh, bioinformatics course, 
um, you would have done um, some course on this, which is to find a common motif. The assumption is that all your sequences are bound by the same protein. So the idea is to look for something that's common, keeping in mind that it's not identical, there's some variation. So what you're learning is, a, is this logo in conjunction with the positions. The logo actually comes from a very nice uh, statistical representation. Right? So if your sequence, uh, if your binding site is eight bases long, um, at every position, you're going to have a distribution over ACGT. And that is what is reflected in your uh, logo here, right? That's just a pictorial representation of how important or how frequent a, a nucleotide is, right? So there are many methods that will do this for you. Essentially, they're trying to find out two things from your gray data set. You're trying to find out the positions of your binding sites and the parameters of the position weight matrix, right? Just that's what it's called. This is statistical representation of the binding infinity. And um, so, so there are many methods, like I said, that do this. And they also, people understand that there may be multiple um, signals, right? Multiple proteins binding the same regions. So the way they do this is you find the top enriched motif. Um, and to do this, they usually use some probabilistic expression that they maximize. Sometimes it's these are enumerated methods, but all this goes into your bioinformatics class. Uh, if you've not taken one and you're interested, you should go ahead and take, take a course on that. Right, so you find the top motif and, um, and then you mask it out. You find the next top motif and you continue doing that, right? Until you say that, you know, there's nothing else in there. Um, and then, like I said, there's lots of popular uh, tools that do this. Um, the problem is that many times um, these motifs don't always make sense um, to the biologist who, is, who has done the experiment because they usually have a sense of what the motif should look like. Or uh, the motif that uh, the biologist expects to come up is not at the top of the list. So how do you really explain the top four if your motif is at the fifth place? What do you do? Right? Um, and, and also this happens because your motif is not really, your the sequence is not present in all of the sequences in a fraction. Um, so the question we asked um, is, why should you even expect just one motif to be totally enriched in the full data set? Um, so I think the assumption is when you're running these experiments uh, or these motif finders is that you have a motif uh, which is bound by your protein, right? This is what you're expecting at every location. But what can happen, because uh, this is biology, is that your protein might, you know, bind in many different ways. You might have, a, it might bind as a homodimer, it might bind as a heterodimer, in which case your specificity now changes, right, depending on your triangle or your cofactor protein. Uh, it can be worse that your protein doesn't make direct contact, right? It just piggybacks uh, with something else which is making the contact. And you could also have these really crazy uh, structures where you're pulling down lots of these uh, regions um, um, indirectly. So what you're really getting from your experiment, uh, the high throughput really experiment, are these uh, after your chip, after you pull down your uh, and with your antibody, you're getting a set of these complexes um, that contain, um, hopefully, <laughs> your protein of interest. Right? And what you get after sequencing and mapping are just these green uh, DNA regions, right? You have no idea which one came from which complex, but you do know really that it, you have multiple uh, modes of binding, multiple complexes in your data. Um, so we um, model it in a different way, right? So we are saying that we understand that there's going to be a, a set of modes of binding. Maybe there's just one. That's okay. That's like we are look, solving a bigger problem then. But we assume that there could be more than one. And let's say we know that there are K binding modes and this is my DNA, set of DNA. The idea is to separate it out, right? To cluster them into different sets. So let's say K is three. So you're gonna have three, a partition of three size um, where every set now, or every subset has its own motif right, because its own binding mode, the reason for it being uh, immunoprecipitated and reported in the experiment. So what we're learning a lot more now, uh, we're learning K different PWMs, right, 
um, and we're also learning the same thing that we were learning earlier, which is a position, right, within each sequence over here. That's also unknown, right? And now the extra thing uh, associated with the 5K is the fact that we don't know which set or which cluster each sequence belongs to. So we are learning that as well, right, in, in addition. Um, it looks like uh, there's a lot of unknowns and that it is true, but we do have a handle on probability here. So we can write a complete description of what of our assumptions, which I just described to you in words in, math, in a mathematical format, um, in a probabilistic format, in fact. And then we learn all the parameters associated with the model to get the best fit, okay? Um, but this is for a given K, right? Uh, how do we know which K, how many partitions to look for? We don't really. So we just do it for every um, reasonable K from one to let's say 10 or 20. Right? So we learn a model for every K and then we do uh, a Bayesian model selection. Now we have all these K, uh, uh, you know, let's say 20 different models and we want to find out the best one, right? So again, we use, go back to our probability understanding and we say that let's compute the probability um, of a given model, given the set of all the possible models and our data. And that can be written using Bayes rule um, as the likelihood multiplied by the prior. So the likelihood is essentially saying, how well does my model explain the data? As I increase my K, this expression will keep going up because you'll get even nicer fits when you look for more and more subsets, right? Because you'll start overfitting, which is why you have this prior term, which is trying to pull down the complete expression that's telling you what is my prior belief about the model even before I look at the data. And the prior belief I have is that I need a simple model. I don't expect there to be like a hundred modes, right? I expect there to be uh, given my understanding of biology to be lower number of modes. So we use a um, exponentially decaying prior. So some uh, in terms of the number of parameters in the model. So the fewer number of parameters you have, there's a higher probability um, of the model being selected, uh, but then it has to be compensated by a good enough likelihood, the pink term. So that's what we really maximize, okay? Um, so let me just show you very quickly uh, a few results. Um, so. It, so I'm going to talk about CTCF, which is a uh, protein um, uh, there in pretty much all vertebrates and also in Drosophila. It's an insulator protein. Um, and Kevin White's lab profiled using ChIP-seq uh, CTCF um, across different fly uh, species in, in, in a very early uh, developmental stage. Right? So this is in vivo, it's a regular ChIP-seq uh, experiment. And this is uh, what they found. They said that, you know, this is the evolutionary tree and we find the expected motif um, in all of them. Okay, and then we decided to explore further on the same data set. So we use this um, Melanogaster data set, which is about 2000 sequences. And this is what the data looks like, okay? So it is, I've shown this pictorially. So every um, sequence um, is, is a row and colored according to the ACGT colors. And I've just shown 200 bases in the neighborhood. So you don't really see any signal right now, because like I said, the motif is not always in the middle. It could be anywhere in the sequence, right? But the summit is in the middle. Um, and then we, we applied our method. Our method said that, you know, after doing all the model selection, um, that eight modes are required, okay? So that's much more than just the CTCF motif. And if you look, uh, so these eight modes, after you find them, we just align them, right? So that's why it looks like now you've got the signal in there. So these are, uh, the right-hand side picture is, uh, contains the same sequences as the left-hand side picture, but just shifted and um, reordered uh, so that every mode or every cluster is together. And, and the motifs also, some of them are fairly similar. Uh, the first four, in fact, are very similar to the um, fly established motif, which is also what they claim to have found um, in, in a majority of their sequences. We also find it in a majority of the sequences. Um, uh, some of them also have this additional thing that looks like the human CTCF motif, 
And the reason I have sort of ordered these modes in this way is just because uh, they're ordered according to the chip score. Yeah. So you remember I showed you the peaks from the chip seek experiment. The height of the peak kind of tells you how much, how highly occupied that region is, right? So that score is kind of taken into account when I'm plotting these box plots. So the first two modes are significantly higher uh, chip enrichment, which is the canonical sort of ply CTCF motif. The others, other two are lower, but these other guys are much lower because they're not really making um, potentially probably not making contact with the DNA, uh, CTCF uh, protein directly. Yeah, that's their assumption. So, so what you see as the diversity in modes kind of relates to the chip score. Okay? Um, we also went further and looked at what these other uh, protein, uh, other motifs were, because they looked like motifs, they're strong motifs. And um, with a little bit of, you know, uh, studying, we found that these matched the motifs of two uh, well-established, well, PETA is, was new at that time, but suppressor of the hairy wing um, uh, is a well-established, also insulator binding protein, had also been, both of these had been um, investigated in their own, for their own chip seek experiments, and you can see the overlap with the modes. So you see the diversity in cofactors that is uh, identified by just applying the algorithm to the original data set. And the promoter element was in fact, indeed, much closer to, the, uh, to any um, transcription start site, really close. So this, all these regions are very close to the TSS. So, uh, and, and the ones that CTCF seems to bind directly are much further away, right? More variable rather. From a transcription start site. So this kind of suggests that maybe CTCF is making contact elsewhere, uh, but probably looping around near the promoter elements uh, and causing them to be pulled down in the chip experiment through indirect binding, right? Um, we also saw that there was diversity in regulation. Um, so, so if you just look at the uh, genes that are in the in proximity of these, because it's very difficult to say uh, you know, when you, once you go further than 2KB, which gene it's really regulating. So we just mm -hmm. focused on the 2KB um, uh, trans, uh, regions that are near the transcription start site. And yeah, I mean, some modes are definitely closer to um, protein um, genes that are expressing highly or activated. Right? The, the, one of the messages of the paper, original paper, was that there's a high uh, diver divergence in CTCF binding. So it turns out that CTCF binding sites evolve in the uh, across the Drosophila species, and we looked at that in terms of the modes, and we saw that uh, well, that's not entirely true. Um, CTCF sites themselves, the direct binding sites, don't seem to be evolving much. So here, the uh, we, I'm plotting what is known as the Pascon score across different flies. So a score of one means that the region is highly conserved, which is magenta here. And a uh, score of zero is that it's not conserved. And uh, you notice that PETA is really not conserved and there are others which are, right? Conserved and other, so, so it turns out that you, it, it's not fair to say all CTCF regions are evolving, but you know, it's, it's, uh, it's probably the cofactors that are evolving uh, more. We also looked at individual, um, fly data and we saw that in fact the PETA motif we could not find in the furthest away uh, fly um, uh, pseudo-obscura species. The others all had very similar PETA motifs in there. So that was kind of reassuring that PETA is just not present and therefore it is not even um, report, it, it's not concerned. All right, so, so this um, was uh, published several years ago now, um, and it's publicly available. Um, you can um, explore, if you have any ChIP-seq data, you can put it in uh, either on the web server or you can download it from GitHub. Um, it's of course free, right? So, so both Sneha and Anushua worked on this. Uh, Sneha later uh, left the lab to join, go elsewhere. And Anushua, who's the second author here, um, she decided to look further into how, div uh, how diversity can be uh, modified or um, extended to uh, look at other kinds of data, 
um, sort of, sort of uh, data that might give different types of information, right? So, so she looked at uh, this slightly newer technique called uh, chips, chip EXO or chip nexus. Uh, so this is a protocol that follows right after your chipping process where uh, you subject your um, complexes, the, the pull down complexes to this exonuclease, it's a lambda exonuclease um, enzyme that chews up uh, single stranded DNA uh, from five prime to three prime end, right? So, it, so, so it'll chew up both the strands. So it'll chew up, up to the five prime end um, and from the other strand as well, right? So what you get after this exercise are much sharper peaks, right? You can imagine that you're you're now going to sequence. You're going to sequence. You're going to get regions uh, peaks really close to the binding site, right? So you get these sharp footprints. So the question is, can we use this data um, to look for the different modes? Right? So so this is what um, it is just a comparison of how chip seek looks like. Um, assuming uh, if, if, if the di uh, direct binding site is somewhere here, you see the uh, chip exo reads are much sharper. You know, it, it, in some sense, it's uh, eating from both ends and you can see the peaks and it's getting hindered by the complex. That's where it stops. Um, the chip seek reads are much broader. <clears throat> um, so, the, so, so there are a few approaches to deal with chip XO data. Um, so one is sort of using um, traditional motif discovery first or use some uh, database collection um, to find where the proteins could be, uh, binding sites could be, and then use uh, the chip XO peak signals to figure out whether there is any signal, specific signal for each of the motifs, right? So this is a two-step two process. Uh, the other way of doing it is, um, you now also use the, um, the, the tags or the read distributions um, along with it, but you initialize, pre-initialize your data with either your meme, with your regular motif search or with um, a tag distribution, right? So either this or that, and then refine your modes, right? Because it's very clear that there are going to be multiple modes, right? Something that we, we were saying exists in regular chip chip seek data also, will clearly also exist in uh, chip um, uh, exo, right? Because chip chip happens first. So just let's just see how real data looks like, right? So this is um, chip nexus data um, for SOX2, I think. Oops, what happened? There it is, yeah. Um, so along with the DNA region, which is now centered along the summit, okay? You also have the positive reads and the negative reads. And you'll notice that unlike chip seek data, you can see the signal in the middle for both, uh, for all three um, data sets. Um, and and, the, and, and so, so we do know, right, that you're still going to have um, uh, different modes, right? That has been our hypothesis the whole time. Um, but now along with every type of binding, we could in principle have a different uh, read signature. Right? And the question is now, can we uh, learn a joint model from both the DNA sequence, which we're anyway doing, in addition to the two sets of reads? So Anush was modified and added a lot of um, lot more variables to incorporate the read distribution along with the DNA data. And a similar kind of a model selection approach was done um, uh, to, to op uh, after the models were learned. And this is what she finds in the SOX2 data sets, right? So this is our, when you apply it to this data, and this is now applied jointly to all three um, sets that you see there, right? The reads and the DNA. Uh, so what happens is you definitely do get after this um, application of what we call now exodiversity, so modification of diversity, because it has the exonuclease in the chip experiment. Um, you see much sharper signals, now they kind of align. Uh, we find 12 modes when you apply it to SOX2, which seemed like a lot. So we explored uh, further and looked, you know, uh, zoomed in um, to see what really was it finding. And we noticed that um, the first seven 
uh, modes are really variants of SOX2, the well-established SOX2 motif, but they have very different, um, either they're different in terms of their DNA um, preferences, um, and actually they're different in DNA preference, along with small changes in the uh, read distributions as well, right? So you can see that the top one is the most enriched one, uh, has stronger um, signals here. Uh, the second mode, the negative strand reads seem to push in, right, by one nucleotide, and it's learning all this in the process. Um, these other modes are, um, uh, they seem to match the OCT4 SOX2 dimer. That's not unexpected to find these this motif. But again, we find variants with varying degrees of uh, exonucleus signals. Um, so we were also worried about whether it is overfitting, and you can read the paper to where we show that it's not. Um, we use all sorts of, we, we use uh, classification techniques and uh, different types of clustering to show that it's, there's actually signal in here. Um, and and I, in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to show you pretty pictures. So here's uh, another picture with Fox A1, where you can see uh, a very distinct um, C rich signal, which doesn't even appear in the well-established Foxy uh, motif, right? Um, you also see this motif, which is our, what you've seen before, is the CTCF one. So, and it looks like Foxy one probably makes indirect contact uh, with uh, CTCF. You see that there are no exonucleus, very, very little exonucleus signal, because the enrichment is happening um, using um, an antibody for Foxy one, right? So you're not getting enough um, uh, CTCF reads to have a very strong exonucleus signal, but uh, that does not hamper the running of exonucleus. Uh, here, what happens is that your um, DNA signal is making up for the lack of um, uh, the strand read signal because you're trying to explain the full data set with potentially diverse modes. Um, so we also looked at CTCF itself. We know that CTCF in the human uh, or at least in vertebrates, um, actually also has a very unique um, structure and binding. Um, it, this is the core um, CTCF site, but it also has an upstream and a downstream motif uh, as shown here, right? It's, that's the way it makes contacts. It's fingers, it's a zinc finger protein and the, the, the different fingers make different contacts. And you can see really nice signals that are captured uh, by the by the method. So wherever you have a strong uh, upstream signal, you get a unique um, exo uh, nucleus signal as well, but not always consistent, right? So we see the different modes that seem to be coming up. Um, we also see, you know, we also looked at conservation, the same fast con scores. So a magenta means highly conserved. And uh, um, for most part, the regions with the upstream motif is more conserved, but not always, right? So you see, do see some places where you have the upstream, but not conser no conservation. So it's somehow it's picking up the fact that you have lower uh, exo signals as well. Right? Um, so this one is um, also available. You can download it uh, freely. Um, or, and if you have any questions, please do write. Uh, if there you find bugs, do write. Um, to me and Anushwa, we'll be happy to uh, fix them. All right, so I think I have maybe like 10 minutes, I'll just, or maybe five minutes, I'll just quickly go to the last part, okay? Uh, the third uh, tool that I'm gonna discuss very briefly. So we looked a lot at, at protein DNA interactions, right, which is the top uh, panel, uh, but then lots of other assays, right, that are being developed, which uh, measure different kinds of biochemical activities like enhancers or just open regions and so on, where now uh, the complexity is higher. You're not only looking for a single protein binding site at every location, you could have a bunch of them uh, at every region, right? So, so, so again, right, all these methods are going to just spit out a bunch of regions that appear to have a common activity. But does that mean that they're going to be governed by the same set of proteins but probably not, right? Because imagine that you're profiling um, uh, all open regions, okay? Now, if you're probing all accessible or open regions, you're going to pull down um, a miscellaneous set, right? You're going to have regions that are open because they're enhancer regions, maybe they're promoter regions, they're just matrix attachment regions and so on, right? There could be different reasons 
um, that they're open and, and the different regions might be governed by different sets of proteins. Uh, similarly for enhancer assays, and there are many different types of assays that measure enhancer activity. Right? ERNAs are one of them, but then there are many others also. Again, when you're probing enhancers, you get a set of regions that have an enhancer activity, but they could be governed by a different set of uh, proteins. Right? Um, so naturally, uh, we should take that into account uh, when we, we can't directly, we can always apply directly diversity to the set, but diversity insists on finding one sort of mode as the main cause or main reason to explain every sequence. So we took a step back and, and thought about how can we um, now have a, uh, have a model that incorporates the fact that you could have multiple uh, binding sites. Right? So what are the biology driven assumptions? So the fact we know is that there's in, in any experiment, um, there are only a set of transcription factors that are active because these are all in vivo in a particular cell type. Right? So we have a set of TFs. We don't know what it is, but we do know it's a finite set. Second thing is that we assume that the activity of the sequence, whatever the activity might be, is driven by a combination of motifs, right? which also seems reasonable. And the experiment is, is like a black box because it's reporting the whole set of sequences. Uh, it could be a mixture of sequences with different motif combinations right? um, um, and different um, reasons for being essentially for being reported but they have the same activity, right? So we make a few additional um, assumptions that make it uh, easier for us to uh, make a computational model out of it. Um, we say that every combination of motifs should appear in enough number of times, right? It, it's highly unlikely that, uh, there's a, that every location has a very unique set of motifs that are governing it. Usually um, in, in, in biology, especially in higher eukaryotes, you have multiple, um, lines of evidence and the line, uh, multiple regions that have similar sets of motifs. So we say that our regions can now be split instead of modes into modules and every module will have a different combination of motifs. So we, so we say at the highest or the lowest level, however you want to put it, we have motifs, okay? Then you have modules which are made up by combinations Right? So here you have three modules being uh, coming from four uh, motifs. The first module has uh, sequences that have motifs of type two and type four. Uh, the second module has you know, the, uh, all three, uh, sorry, first, third, and fourth or whatever. Right? And what you're of course getting at the end from the experiment are just this green set now, again, a mixture. So the idea is to, from this bottom set, we want to get all this back, right? And this, we borrow this um, representation from what is known as topic modeling um, in, in, in uh, computer science, but it's not really exactly that because we don't really know the words here. So the motifs are also learned, okay? So it's a little more complex and different, uh, but that's the general idea. Right, so, so the idea is essentially you have your DNA sequences. We still want to cluster them. We don't know how many clusters, uh, but the, now the clustering is dependent on the presence or absence, right, of a motif. So the first cluster contains um, sequences that have these last two um, motif binding sites. So essentially what we're saying is that does do these regions have these binding sites, right? Um, and they have, so the first set also does not have any hexagon binding site, right? So that is, is a characterization of that module. So there's a lot of unknowns now. Um, so at the motif level, we say that there are maximum of M motifs. We don't know their identity. Um, we don't, we also don't know how the size of the motif, the distribution, the PWMs. Uh, we say that there are maximum of R modules and each module is sort of characterized by the probability of having each motif in there or not, right? So it's a Bernoulli distribution. And at the sequence level, we have to also learn the different positions of the, that still uh, is from the earlier um, uh, um, representation, right? Where the motif is present. 
And of course, again, we need to cluster so that identity is unknown. So there's again a lot of unknowns. Um, we, but we do, again, we are able to write the posterior and the likelihood distributions. And we learn all these um, unknown variables um, using Gibbs sampling. Okay? And I'll very quickly show you uh, the results. So this is on simulated data where uh, we have mixed up, we have intentionally put in um, three modules coming from five motifs, and it actually learns um, um, the exact same. In spite of being told there could be a maximum of 10 uh, modules and 20 motifs, it still says that there are only five motifs and three modules, gets back the structure fairly well. All right, so what you're seeing here are not the full sequences, of course, because the motifs can occur in any orientation and um, position, but you're just seeing this as a regular clustering data output where uh, a black uh, signifies absence of the site and the color just signifies the actual uh, region that is contributing to the motif in there. Right? And this is a pictorial representation of just showing you the proportion of every motif in every module. Um, so, so I just showed you a nice picture where it works really well, but we ensured that it does well in, in most simulated settings. Uh, by, and of course, you need to have a sense, a measure of what doing well means, uh, because uh, if your modules are initially more or less separable, you're going to do better or worse, right? So we use, uh, the, there's a parameter when we are um, planting the sequences in there. Uh, or the motifs uh, that governs how peaky your distribution of your um, motif presence, the Bernoulli distribution is gonna be. And a lower value just means it's more peaky, peaky, right? Not peaky, not peaky. So it's going to be a two or zero or one. So your modules are more separable. And that's when, of course, you do much better. Um, it actually surprisingly does really well as a motif discovery method. So if you just forget about the fact that you're looking for modules in addition to the motifs and just look at the motifs, it is in fact better than the standard uh, approaches I mean, compared with meme and Homer. And it, it surprisingly does well. It does well even when we don't plant any modules, right? Um, so that, that was reassuring. Um, so, um, Devarka, how much time do I have? Should I, should I just stop here? Well, um, so um, th this is this is it basically. But if you want to take more, no, time. this is the time. No, I should not go ahead. So let me just yeah. very quickly um, yeah. show you one one picture, and I will stop. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, so I'll just perfect. show you. So it 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 generally works well in um, promoters and attack seek data. And I'll just show you one last part where we looked at attack seek data in different mouse tissues in human. Um, and this is um, what we find in the brown fat tissues, one of them. And it actually automatically finds, segregates your modules into those that contain um, fat specific motifs and those that are constitutively active without give, being given any information, right? So you have essentially, it, it is just, you give it the whole set of open regions, op regions that are open in this particular tissue and ask it to cluster without given, being given any information about the, the motifs or the transcription factors that are active. And it finds clusters of regions which are dominated either by, you know, mostly by the specific uh, motifs or that are ubiquitous, right? So these are the ubiquitous ones. And all these modules that it finds seem to have very distinct characteristics as well. Okay, so, so uh, the ones that are more uh, dominated by the constituent uh, constitutively active um, motifs of transcription factors are in fact more um, open, right, in, in the attack seek context. Um, and the ones we also, they're also closer to, a prom to the promoter region. So the ones that are dominated, the top ones, modules which are dominated by the um, tissue specific proteins are further away from the transcription side, then mark of enhancers, right? They are usually further away and, and, and more tissue specific. Right, so this is also uh, uh, downloadable, freely available. So if you have any kind of data that you suspect has a similar um, biochemical activity, just put it in here and uh, let us know what you find. If you find bugs, 
please tell us. And uh, thank you for your attention. Hi, Alilamthi. Thanks. Uh, for the wonderful talk, I guess. And I would uh, open it up for the attendees. And uh, anybody can ask any question by unmuting. I don't know if unmuting.